In this module, we are going to examine some of the basics concerning biarticular MTCs. Before doing so, let's review how an MTC length changes with joint rotations. Let's begin by seeing how the MTC length changes during rotations of a single joint. Here, we have a generic joint with two MTCs, one on each side of the joint. Their lengths are annotated by L1 and L2, respectively. The joint rotated in a counterclockwise direction, and note the length changes in both L1 and L2, denoted by the prime after the rotation. Since it's hard to visualize the differences, let's compare them side by side. We are used to thinking about an MTC shortening to rotate a joint. What's sometimes underappreciated is the MTC on the opposite of that joint has to lengthen. Now, let's examine what happens with biarticular MTCs. First, some nomenclature. A monoticular MTC crosses a single joint. An example would be the vastus lateralis, which just crosses the knee. A biarticular MTC crosses two joints. An example would be the hamstrings, which cross both the knee and the hip. A polyarticular MTC crosses three or more joints. An example would be the biceps brachii, which crosses the shoulder, elbow, and proximal radial ulnar joints. It's usually a mouthful to say polyarticular, and most people use biarticular as kind of a lazy shorthand for both biarticular and polyarticular MTCs, and we'll do the same here. We have an example of a generic system with two joints and one MTC crossing both joints. After a rotation of the right joint in the clockwise direction, Note that we have an increase in MTC length, denoted by the prime symbol. After a rotation of the left joint in the clockwise direction, note that we have a decrease in MTC length, again denoted by the prime symbol. Now, if both the left and right joints rotate simultaneously, and here we have to assume that they have equal moment arms and rotate by the same amount, we will see that the length of the MTC is unchanged it lengthened across the right joint while it shortened across the left joint. It really didn't do both of these, it just didn't change its length. But it's usually easier to visualize if we break it up and look at each joint individually, and then put the whole system back together again. Recall that an MTC produces its greatest amount of force at approximately its resting length. If we go too far to one side or the other of this optimal length, force producing capabilities decrease. Monoarticular MTCs usually operate about this apex, but since biarticular MTCs are affected by rotations about two joints, they can undergo larger length changes than monoarticular MTCs. In this case, the left joint rotated in a counterclockwise direction, while the right joint rotated in the clockwise direction. The MTC lengthened across the left joint and it lengthened across the right joint. The net effect is an overall lengthening of the MTC. If the MTC is now on the descending limb of the force length curve, its ability to produce force is decreased. This is known as passive insufficiency. In this case, the left joint rotated in the clockwise direction while the right joint rotated in the counterclockwise direction. The MTC shortened across the left joint and it shortened across the right joint. The net effect is an overall shortening of the MTC. If the MTC is now on the ascending limb of the force length curve, its ability to produce force is also decreased. This is known as active insufficiency. With these ideas in mind, let's go over some general rules concerning exercises involving biarticular MTCs. First, if you wish to stretch the biarticular MTC, you must lengthen it across both joints. If you try to lengthen it across one joint, but you allow it to shorten over another, the overall length won't change, or change that much, and you won't effectively stretch that MTC. Second, if you want to strengthen or test the strength of a biarticular MTC, then you want to lengthen it across one joint while shortening it across another. 
By doing so, you are trying to keep the MTC's length around the plateau of the force length curve so that you can maximize its force producing capability. Of course, the same idea can be used if you want to decrease the force producing capability of a biarticular MTC. You'd do this if you'd want to maximize the contributions of its synergists. These ideas will be clearer if we use an example. For this example, I will use the biarticular hamstrings. The pictures here show an increase in hamstring length from left to right. Note that if we extend the hip, we shorten the hamstrings across its proximal end. The opposite happens if we flex the hip. We lengthen the hamstrings across its proximal end. If we flex the knee, we shorten the hamstrings across their distal end. And if we extend the knee, we lengthen the hamstrings across their distal end. This only happens if we isolate one joint motion. When both joints are moving, the overall length is either increasing, decreasing, or staying the same. But again, it's easier to visualize it if we look at each joint individually and then combine the effects of their motions together. Now, let's see how this applies to stretching the hamstrings. In the top case, we try to stretch the hamstrings by flexing the hip. This will lengthen the hamstrings across the hip, but if we allow the knee to flex, then the hamstrings will shorten across the knee. The net effect could be no change in hamstring length, and we won't get an effective stretch of it. In the bottom, note that we are flexing the hip with the knee extended. This causes the hamstrings to lengthen across both joints. The net effect is an overall lengthening of the hamstrings and a more effective stretch. Now let's look at trying to strengthen or test the strength of isolated knee flexion. In the top case, the hamstrings are in a relatively shortened position across the hip while they are shortening across the knee. The overall net effect is a shortening of the hamstrings that could decrease their ability to produce force. The bottom shows a position where the hip is flexed. In this case, the hamstrings are in a relatively lengthened position at the hip while shortening across the knee. The overall net effect is a decrease in shortening from its optimal length compared to the top position. This is why you sometimes see hamstring curl machines that have an apex around the hips. They are attempting to put the hamstrings in a lengthened position before shortening with the idea that the hamstrings can produce more force by doing so. Let's not forget about trying to strengthen or test the strength of isolated hip extension. The hamstrings will also produce a torque about the hip. In the top case, the hip is extending while the knee is flexed. Note that the hamstrings are shortening across the hip while also in a shortened position about the knee. The net effect is an overall shortened position of the hamstrings. This will decrease the contributions of the hamstrings to, to hip extension. The idea here is that if you want to decrease the contributions from the hamstrings, then you'll increase the contributions from the other hip extensors, namely the glute max. So if you want to maximize the contributions of the glute max, you'd perform isolated hip extension in this position. If you wanted to maximize the hamstrings contribution to isolated hip extension, then you would extend the knee. This would lengthen the hamstrings across the knee while they are shortening across the hip. The overall net change in hamstring length is less than the top position, again trying to keep them on the plateau region of the force length curve. In the prep guide, I'm going to ask you to consider other biarticular MTCs, and then go through a similar thought process for both stretching and strengthening them. So that's the basics of biarticular MTCs. We showed how joint rotations affect the length of the MTCs they cross. With biarticular MTCs, we have to consider the length changes about both ends and how that leads to a net effect of shortening, lengthening, or no change. We then use this knowledge to think of ways to ideally stretch and strengthen the biarticular MTCs using the hamstrings as an example. Now it's time for you to apply this to other MTCs in the body.